Amen. Well, get a, give us a running start. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. So tonight we start a four-part series to close out our congregational midweeks for 2023. We're going to be diving into the International Christian Church's five core convictions. Uh, we are the Fresno International Christian Church. Yeah. Part of the Thrive family of churches, which is another couple churches, one in San Francisco, one in Sacramento, and we are part of a much larger community that is all of California and incorporates uh, Los Angeles. Um, We've got a church that is part of our group in uh, Nevada, in Las Vegas, Uh, and we've got three churches, uh, actually four churches now. Uh, in the central U.S., one in on this side of the Rockies, one on the other side of the Rockies, so Salt Lake, Denver, uh, Laramie, Wyoming, and then down to uh, Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, are all part of our family of churches, but we're even part of a bigger family of churches all throughout Central and South America that's even part of a bigger family of churches that's all over the world. Amen? And so uh, we're going to dive into our five core convictions. Now, I like to call them personally our five core distinctives, not necessarily our five core convictions. Why? Uh, Because oftentimes what can happen is people go, oh, these are your five core convictions? What about the gospel? What about Jesus? What about, you know, it's like, okay, like, let's, let's be adults about this. You know what I mean? Uh, So to differentiate from these are our core convictions, but really our core convictions are uh, the gospel, right? What, the, what, like, what about God, the Bible, sin, salvation, Jesus, his death on the cross, his resurrection, the kingdom, the church, uh, all these kinds of things, the Holy Spirit, all those kinds of things. We just spent about 10 weeks walking through those in our first principles. So this is why we're doing these after our first principle, because those really are our core convictions. What does the Bible say and what we believe about how somebody comes to faith and then practices that faith from a biblical perspective? But what is it that differentiates our family of churches and our church here in Fresno from the bazillion other churches in Fresno? I mean, just from this place here, you could throw a rock in any direction and you'd hit a church. So, what is it, what is it that, that kind of separates us from other denominations, other religious groups, and other religious organizations? The reality is that the foundation of the church is the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. This is clear. I hope it's clear to us here. But beyond that, what Uh, dictates our practices and distinctives, and that's what we're going to get into over the course of the next four weeks. The first two really come together in great harmony because they all talk about the Bible, the Word of God. So conviction number one is we are a Bible church, not just a New Testament church. And conviction number two that we're going to dive into here in a little bit dives into we're silent where the Bible speaks, and we speak where the Bible is silent. Now, we'll talk about what that means here in just a little bit, but before we dive into that one, we're going to dive into we're not just a New Testament church. We are a Bible church. Now, this might seem like a weird place to start. Maybe you've been in a church for so long that you're like, well, yeah, of course, the whole Bible, of course, the Old and New Testaments, like, okay, whatever. But... The reality is that there's a lot of Christian groups out there that disregard the Old Testament to a great degree. Hey, the Old Testament, a lot of cool stories. Uh, you know, yeah, Shadrach, me, fiery furnace, Daniel and the lions, then Goliath. You know what I mean? Like, let's focus on those things, right? Uh, as my nephew used to call the prince of Egypt, the pritchy itchy. You know, Joseph and all that kind of stuff. You know, those are cool stories but they have no relevance to modern-day Christians. We don't believe that. We don't believe that. The entire Bible is usable, and we're going to dive into what does that look like. Now, 
as basic as it sounds to you and me, again, this is not what many churches or denominations believe. Some denominations and churches actually believe the opposite. They go, hey, the Old Testament is what it's all about. This is our place of practice, is the Old Testament. And they overemphasize the Old Testament and neglect the New Testament. Others overemphasize the New Testament and neglect the Old Testament. So, in our first part tonight, we're going to look into why we are a whole Bible church. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. What parts of the Old Testament do we follow? Which do we not? All of these things will be uncovered. Not in there, we're not going to exhaust this topic, but we are going to dive into enough for us to understand what uh, we believe about this. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, it says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those for whom you learned it. Now, this is Paul talking with his young son in the faith, Timothy. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is one of our uh, first principle Scriptures uh, that we're very familiar with. Right, And it says all Scripture is God-breathed, all Scripture, meaning that all Scripture is inspired by God. Now, let's just look at this from a technical perspective. Yes, all Scripture is the Old and New Testaments. However, what was the Scriptures that Paul was talking about here when he wrote this? Well, there weren't any books of the New Testament written Or if there were, there were letters that were written to the churches and they were kind of loosely kind of, uh, you know, gone to different places. There wasn't anything authorized. There wasn't anything codified. So the reality is, how did Timothy from infancy know the Holy Scriptures? Well, we know his mom was a Jew. We know his grandma was a Jew. So what did he learn? He learned the Old Testament. And then when they became disciples, they learned... What, uh, what the, that the Old Testament pointed to Christ, pointed to Jesus, and Paul uh, obviously taught him a bunch about that. But this Old Testament, or the, the scriptures that he was referring to, are the Old Testament scriptures. For us, when we think about it as the old and new, but in Paul's time, he had in mind just the Old Testament. But go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, says, They devoted themselves, they being the first century church, this is the first church service, the the first 3,120 to to join the kingdom, they devoted themselves, the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. We learn from here that the first century church and its members devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Note it just doesn't say, hey, they devoted themselves to the Pentateuch. They devoted themselves to the prophets. They devoted themselves to the Psalms. Now, we know that they did. We know that they did. But there was a shift in, hey, they listened to the words of the apostles. Now, where would the apostles get their teaching? Well, they obviously would get it from the Old Testament, putting it together with what they knew from Jesus. In fact, we see that all throughout Acts chapter 2, where Peter gives this stirring sermon, and he's pulling stuff from Isaiah, he's pulling stuff from Joel, he's pulling stuff from the Psalms, right? What is he using? He's using the Old Testament to preach a New Testament sermon, which is how these people got saved. In the New Testament books, such as Matthew, Mark, John, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation, those were apostles. So much of the New Testament is actually written by the apostles. But if you go through, much of the New Testament is actually written back to look at the Old Testament. So the first century church would have also, over the course of time, incorporated the writings and the teachings of the apostles and adopted them as scripture, which is what we see over the course of church history. So we know that the Old Testament is part of the New Covenant, New Testaments, the the apostles and the prophets and and all that. We know also then that we've got the writings of not just uh, the apostles, 
but we also have Paul's writings in the New Testament. So is that authoritative? I mean, if the first century church, if we know the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, that would be the Old Testament. That would also be the, uh, the apostles of Jesus. Now, we do know that Paul was an apostle, but where does it say that his teachings are authoritative? We'll go to 2 Peter chapter 3. What about Paul's writings as one who wrote most of the New Testament? Do his books and letters have any bearing on us today? 2 Timothy chapter 3, look here in verse 15. Second Peter. Did I say Timothy? Oh, my bad. Second Peter, excuse me. Chapter 3, verse 15. It says, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Peter in this passage is speaking about Paul's writings, and you notice that Peter lumps in the writings and teachings of Paul with the other scriptures that people tend to distort. So we see here that even the apostle Peter considered Paul's writings authoritative and therefore scripture. So, now that we know that the first century church was an Old and New Testament church, as much as they could be since they did not have all the scriptures until about 140 AD, let's discuss what of the biblical scriptures actually apply to us today. Well, the New Testament writers looked back into the Old Testament for much of their content. Much like if you and I are writing a paper, we're getting an article from online, or we're going to the library and getting books, they did the same thing with the Old Testament scriptures. There are 302 direct Old Testament quotes in the New Testament. There are 493 allusions of the Old Testament, meaning not a direct quote, but hey, this, this grouping of passages really has a cross-reference over here. There are 138 possible allusions of the Old Testament. So a total Old Testament reference in the New Testament, 933. So as we can see, the Old Testament was quite relevant to those in New Testament times. We already know that the whole New Testament applies to our lives as a church living in the New Testament times, living under the New Covenant. But what about the Old Testament then does or does not apply to us? Go to Colossians chapter 2. Come on, brother. Now, this might seem somewhat obvious to some of us. The Mosaic Law does not apply to us. The ceremonial law does not apply to us. That's why here on a Wednesday night, we do not have a stone altar here. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, we've got, you know, sacrifices. You know what I mean? Uh, Elena did not bring one of her goats for us to sacrifice. You know what I mean? Cute little goats. You know what I mean? We're not doing that here. Why? Because the ceremonial law, the Mosaic law, doesn't apply to us. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 says, When you were dead in your sins and in the circumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. Talking about the law. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. In this passage, we see that God, through Jesus on the cross, nailed our legal indebtedness to that cross. What does that mean? It means that the old covenant law is no longer binding on us today. It was gone. It's been done away with. Now, before I go too further, let me mention, I've used, uh, or tried not to use up to this point, but I've, I think I've let it slip, this idea of covenant. You have testament and you have covenant. Let's talk about what a covenant is. A covenant is an agreement or a contract. Theologically, a covenant is an agreement which brings about a relationship between God and His people. The Jewish faith is based on the covenant that God had with Abraham, with Moses, and with David. Also, uh, Noah and, uh, and you know Adam and Eve had a particular covenant. Okay, the Christian faith is based on the covenant that God has with Jesus, 
And through his covenant with Christ, he also has a covenant with us as his followers. Okay, well, what is a testament? Well, since I've been throwing it down this word a lot, a, template, a testament is simply a person's will, right? You might have heard, right, we kind of know uh, uh, somebody's will is their last, their, their, their dying wishes, but a will is short for will in testament, right? So the Old Testament and the Old Covenant is an agreement between God and Abraham, Moses, and David, and the will of God for the people under the Old Covenant or the Old Contract. The New Covenant or the New Testament is an agreement between God and His Son Jesus and those who would follow Him and the will of God for the people under that New Covenant. Again, this does not diminish the importance of one part of the Bible over the other. So then why does this matter? There are churches and denominations out there that believe that the Old Testament, again, has more weight and validity today. And equally, there are churches and denominations that believe that the New Testament is the only grouping of books for life and practice in today's Christian church. The Church of Christ, of which we have our roots, uh, we'll get into that a little bit in our number two study, is one of those churches who believes that the New Testament alone for their faith and practice and doctrines. So only New Testament. They still believe that the Old Testament is inspired by God, but that its teachings do not have any bearing on New Testament Christianity. Well, we in the Fresno Church, and indeed the international Christian churches, believe like Paul that all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for us today. Amen. This includes the Old Testament, again, minus the Mosaic Law and minus the Ceremonial Law and the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 says, again, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So you'll notice that it's not built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, and Moses. Otherwise, the Mosaic law would be a part of that. It's the prophets. Matthew 7, 12 says, so in everything due to others, what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Any time where Scripture is put together, in, in the Gospels anyway, law and prophets is put together, meaning the entirety of the Old Testament. But we just read in Ephesians that law is not part of that. It's just prophets. Amen? Amen. So what does this mean? It means that, again, the Old Covenant, the Mosaic and Ceremonial Laws, are done away with, they have been nailed to the cross, and what remains are the spiritual principles in those books. The prophets still have relevance for us today in that they teach us the blessings and the punishments of not following God's way. Right? Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Come on, bro. We've looked at this before. But this is why we believe that we are commanded to build a church that has its footing not just in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament, because we want to do things God's way. You will understand why this is the first of our core convictions, because from here, we get the authorization to use Old Testament passages to fulfill other core conventions, such as biblical interpretation, central leadership, things of that nature. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 through 17, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know from whom you learned it. And now from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All of the Old Testament points to Christ. All the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of Christ. Again, the scriptures that he was calling for were the ones in the Old Testament. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Come on. Matthew chapter 5. Look here in verse 18. For truly I tell you, this is Jesus talking, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Wow. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. What we see here is that Jesus didn't 
put down the Old Testament, but said that all must be upheld until everything had been accomplished. But if everything has already been accomplished, then, which some say has, then why do we need the Old Testament? We'll go to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Look here in verse 4. The Bible says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So what do we do? We look back at the Old Testament and go, Man, they made it. Man, they were dumb. Like, look at these yahoos, man. Why, why would they make that kind of decision? I'm not making that decision. They're an example that we follow because we see the endurance taught through the Scriptures and the encouragement we provide. They might have hope. 1 Corinthians 10, 6, write that down, says this. Now, these things occurred as examples to us to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Look at that Old Testament. You see where they put their pla- they place their hearts, where they place their focus and go, uh-uh, I'm not doing that because I see the outcome. Right? This is why oftentimes maybe an older Christian will come up here and share about their life. We go, oh man, I'm going to learn from that. I ain't doing that. We get the same opportunity when we look into the Old Testament. Later in that same passage, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the age has come. What do we see here? Neglect the Old Testament at your own peril. We see these passages, they say why we must pay attention to the Old Testament and have it in a central place in the life of a disciple in the church. This is why, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I balance my sermon series with a little bit of Old Testament, a little bit of New Testament. We kind of pop back and forth, right? Because it's important for us to understand both covenants, both testaments, so that we can learn from them. I'm excited this... This coming year and and towards the end, obviously, this end of this year, we're going to dive into the book of Ruth. Uh, It's going to be awesome. We're going to dive into the seven churches of the Revelation, so the beginning. We're going to dive into the Ten Commandments. This one I'm really excited about. We're going to dive into the Ten Commandments. I'm going to connect the the Ten Commandments with their counterpart then in the New Testament and what Jesus had to say about them. It's going to be awesome. We are indeed here in Fresno and around the world a Bible church and not just a New Testament church. We need the entire Bible to stay faithful to God. And in our restoration of New Testament church, their Bible should be just as important to us. Amen? Amen. Amen. That is, we are a Bible church, not a New Testament church. Uh, That is core conviction number one. Amen? Amen. Amen.